How's it going, everybody? Maximum Gee here at the PAX East 2013 Show Floor, talking with GameSpot alum Greg Kasavin, now of Super Giant Games, and we are checking out Transistor, their next project. Greg, how you doing? Doing really, really, really well, though beginning to lose my voice apparently. But I imagine you guys have had a massive turnout here in the booth. I imagine you've been you've been running around all day showing off this game. Yeah, although mostly standing still, but yes, um, yeah, the response has been really amazing. We just announced the game um, just two days ago, or something like something like that. Two days. Uh, it all kind of runs together sometimes. Yeah, and um, now we're letting people play it for the first time, and um, the response has been really terrific uh, to our. Uh, you, you know, to our great uh, relief, really. I mean, we this is the first time we've revealed a game since I think people like kind of cared about us. I would say because when we first showed Bastion, uh, no one had ever heard of us, so we kind of had nothing to lose. And this time, um, people expect a lot from us, um, and so it's been really great to show something and get a good response and see that people like we're we're going with it. All right, well, let's go ahead and jump into yeah. Transistor and see what it's all about. You want to set up this game for us? Uh, yes, um, this is just a little bit of a preamble to set the stage for what's about to happen here. Uh, you play as uh, this woman uh, who's called Red, um, and something, uh, she's having a really bad evening, let's just say. <clears throat> she's about to appear uh, all the way across uh, the city of Cloudbank, and uh, she has appeared here under uh, some pretty bad circumstances. So. I'm going to kind of uh, wander up here and discover something else has shown up. Um, and a voice inside it has started, well, that's a bit of a spoiler, I suppose. Uh, this here is the transistor, which is um, a weapon of extraordinary power. And uh, it does not belong to her, but she's going to take it anyway. Um, and uh, we'll see what happens from there. So, she's acquired it, and uh, there's a voice coming from inside of it speaking to her. You can see it flashing and stuff like that. Um, so now, it's essentially, she is on the run from these forces that are going to pursue this weapon uh, by any means to try to get it back, because it's very important to them. Uh, but she's going to decide, you know, I, I, I don't think I want to give it back. I think I'm going to hang on to it. Um, so we we encounter these uh, these uh, unusual kind of uh, creatures, strange beings called the process. Um, they have a way of uh, they kind of come right back to life unless you get rid of them permanently. Um, so you need to collect these cells, and they get absorbed into the transistor, and then the process are kind of eliminated permanently. Um, so is the collection of the cell just as simple as it looks like you just ran over yeah, and picked them right up? You just run right over it, yeah. there's um, you, you just got to get close enough to it, but you'll see that that uh, kind of comes into play as part of the combat. So here I'm trying to es escape, but uh, more of these guys show up, and here's the introduction of something that is uh, we think is pretty special about this game. Um, at just about any point during combat, you have access to this strategic planning mode where you can basically sequence your actions and then execute them at sort of a super-powered rate. And uh, it looks like we had a, a, a bit of an action meter. Yeah, we see it refilling there up yeah. top that sort of allows us to choose that, which actions we have access yeah, that's for. that's exactly right. You, I'm, I'm glad you picked up on that that quickly. Um, so yeah, as you, as you move around and you can actually undo your actions, um, you can you know, decide what is the best course of action and you see it up at the top of the screen showing the sequence and you can un, you know, start over. Um, and decide how to best take care of these guys, um, and then do it. Um, and then obviously it looks like your stronger attacks take off more of the meter yeah. than perhaps just walking around or doing something something less. Y yeah, exactly. There's a, there's a different balancing of the different abilities and and stuff like that depending on um, uh, you, you know depending on their overall power. So um, that that planning mode like allows us to approach the, the combat and, and, and encounters in this game like from a really interesting point of view because it's such a, it's such a powerful ability that it in turn uh, makes us uh, want to create uh, opponents in situations that are very challenging um, so that you could use this ability to overcome them. Um, it's been really fun for us uh, on the team because we all uh, kind of use it differently. The game is designed so that you can be effective without using it. Um, 
uh, a lot of the time at least, but it's kind of there to help you out in a pinch uh, and, and get through tough situations. So whether you use it all the time or whether you use it when you get in trouble, um, whether you use it to be defensive or, or to just really lay into guys, that's all up to you. That That's part of what is interesting about it to us. Now I know a uh, large part of the original Bastion for me was having access to all these different weapons and all the different abilities they had therein. Whereas it looks like in this game, Red's that that sort of large, oversized sword she's got is, is sort of an uh, iconic weapon you've built for her. Is that, is that weapon going to sort of have its own set of abilities like we saw with the weapons in Bastion? Uh, yeah, the idea is, uh, so the, trans uh, the, the weapon that she has is the transistor itself, um, and it uh, possesses a number of different abilities. I'm actually about to get a new one here. Um, part of sort of the mystery of this game is like, the, the uh, discovering the limit of this thing's powers um, and and all the different powers that it has in it and acquiring new powers. So here, essentially, I interacted with uh, what we call a trace. It's almost like a ghost. Excuse me. It's like a woman who's been, uh, uh, you know, essentially killed by by these process uh, creatures and um, by by sort of integrating her into the transistor. I now have access to yet another ability. So, um, so she can sort of get her revenge a little bit by granting you this new power. Uh, that that is indeed uh, the case. Yeah. So she's sort of coming along for the ride, um, in a way. And so you'll be able to. We don't show a ton of it at the moment, but the idea is that you'll be able to uh, reconfigure many aspects of it. And um, I was going to ask, like, are you going to have different ability loadouts, and you can like switch and swap different abilities for your weapon? Yeah, that's that's definitely what we're looking at. Um, and uh, but but we want to play around with it um, in in some surprising ways. Uh, le so the the idea is we the transistor has sort of a chaotic power to it. Um, so we want it to keep kind of surprising you. But yeah, you'll be able to. Uh, do things like configure it and use a variety of different uh, abilities through it. Um, now, are you worried at all about a players abusing this time stop mechanic too much and just sort of oversimplifying the combat? Uh, we are not worried about that. We think it like introduces a lot of depth. Um, this actually is an example of an encounter where um, a strategy that may have been effective in like against the first couple of enemies is less effective here. So this particular enemy, if I um, attack her, you know, repeatedly, just try to kill her, you discover that as soon as you hit her once, she moves to a new location and, and creates a copy of herself. So you can't just, you know, unload all of your attacks onto her and 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 kill her in one turn. So we wanna we wanna play around with those rules um, quite a bit and uh, yeah, because that way it forces you into. It requires multiple turns, no matter what you use. Yeah, and it requires you to change tactics as well. And we, that, that's, to us, that's like the promise of this whole thing is just having to like study these opponents that you're fighting and come up with a plan. And sometimes your plan is very successful. Other times it doesn't go quite as you expect. Um, and that's part of the fun of having like a planning mode. If your plan always happened exactly as you thought it would, then it wouldn't be very interesting. Uh, but, um, we're, we're, you know, like I said, we're kind of playing around with that to, to try and uh, get at the right balance there, where you know most of the time you feel pretty in control, but not all the time, um, and hopefully that leads to interesting results. Something that kind of caught my interest. So you defeated the boss enemy. It, you know, as boss enemies do, it sprouts out a bunch of like rewards and pickups at the end. But you weren't able to collect them all at once, and it ended up sort of coming back to bite you there when they turned into enemies. Yeah, that's right, and that's a, again, that's an example of how these cells they just like if you don't get them quickly enough, they're gonna they're gonna cause you problems, and that's kind of that's been a really fun dynamic for us as well. Well, I don't want to spoil this completely, but um, the um, you know, in uh, w one of the one of the reasons that was really interesting to us as a mechanic was um, we. Uh, it forces you out of position. Like you can, you could stand back and like snipe enemies from long range using some of these powerful attacks. Uh, but if you kill a guy who's too far away from you, he's just going to respawn. So it, it flushes you out of your cover and kind of put, puts you into some awkward uh, situations. So, all right, Greg. So something else I wanted to touch on. Obviously, uh, the art style of this game sort of has this very unique, almost cyberpunk esque look yeah. to it. Very different from what was in the. Uh, the original Bastion. Can you talk a little about, perhaps about the inspirations behind this world style? Yeah, I mean the way um, it's really important to us that this game uh, have have its own identity and like we wanted to make a whole new game. Um, and uh, I, I guess the the simplest way to to describe it is like if, if Bastion is our take, 
on on the fantasy genre, then this is our take on science fiction. Um, we wanted, to, you know, we were interested in exploring like some of the ideas of of, of these types of science fiction worlds, like a like a like an urban setting. You know, you know, the setting of this game is a city, stuff like that. Um, and we we love like cyberpunk type stuff. And at the same time, it's like it's been done so well in so many games that we're we just don't want to do the straight ahead like cyberpunk thing just because it's already been done well so many times. Um, we'd rather kind of fi find our own approach to it. And this it took a long time, uh, just like with Bastion, it takes us a while for our, our ideas to like coalesce into something relatively coherent. Um, and uh, and this is what we came up with. Um, so yeah, we hope uh, once again it's a world of kind of uh, very interesting mystery and depth that people can like learn a lot about as they play through it uh, in a way that's not kind of distracting. They just naturally get kind of pulled into it and become invested in what's happening to the characters and what's happening to this location and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it's a. Uh, you know, the, the inspirations are almost too numerous to mention um, because it's it's games and and books and films and all kinds of different things. And, and the inspirations are unique uh, to each member of the team as well to a certain extent. There's no, like, we don't approach this stuff from, like, we want to do this game meets that game or something like that. It's, it's just a more, like, organic process for us, I think. So what were the advantages of going with this new IP, Transistor, instead of just making a Bastion 2? Uh, I don't know that there are any advantages in the sense that, like, advantages is, like, not the, the term we would use to describe it. I think it's, like, it would it would have been easier for us, I think, just to make a Bastion 2 or whatever, um, but we really, really enjoyed uh, making a world from scratch on Bastion and creating... Um, I, I would I would sort of put it that way, and and... With, with this, it's a chance to do it again. I think like world building on Bastion is something that was a well-regarded part of the game. Um, and um, we, so we wanted to see if we could do it again. Um, and uh, and both like thematically and gameplay wise, we're doing stuff with this game that, that I don't think would make a ton of sense in Bastion. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's an excuse for us to like explore a bunch of stuff that I don't think would feel right in the in in Bastion's world. So that's that's why we wanted to do it. Whether um, whether it's the right thing to do, I think is for the people at PAX uh, to decide. Uh, thankfully, they seem to be enjoying it thus far. Yeah, you guys. As I mentioned earlier, you guys have a massive crowd here. Can you speak at all about sort of what the response has been like? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the response has been awesome. I, I like I I think we're all sort of. We just really, really appreciate it because if not for Bastion, we wouldn't be able... Bastion's success is what enables us to you know, work together as a team again, self-fund another game and, and just like make the game we want to make again. Um, so that, um, it's not lost on us that it sort of requires a, a lot of faith from our fans uh, to, to, you know, pull off something like this because a lot of these people, they love Bastion and they would probably like for us just kind of to keep doing that stuff but i think a lot of people you know what they liked about bastion was that it was it wasn't like something that they had played recently or something like that it felt different and so creating that different feeling um making something that doesn't feel quite like stuff that you've played recently is uh is really important to us so we're again just above all really really grateful for the response we've had so far the the feedback that we get from people is immensely valuable because this is still early. Uh, the game isn't due out until early uh, early next year. So um, this is really going to kind of embolden us to keep pushing forward and, and make this game, you know, better and better. So we're just happy that people like what they've seen of it so far. And speaking of release, are you guys still aiming for the same platforms that, that Bastion saw? Uh, it's it's too early to say with regard to platforms. I mean, I don't, I don't know that anyone knows what's going to happen over the next... Uh, six or 12 months with regards to new gaming platforms. So we're, we're as interested to see how that stuff pans out as anybody. And um, we gained a lot of experience on Bastion. Like uh, it, we, we brought the game to multiple platforms um, and tried to make sure each version of the game was, was really solid. Um, so I, I think that puts us in a good position to, to make sure we kind of do the right thing for this game when the time comes as well, so. All right, Greg, well, thank you so much for chatting with us. Enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you, you guys too. Thanks, thanks a lot.